Thomas says, I'm not going to be that one to turn my back on you. I am going to be there for you. I am not going to forsake you, so much so that you can have confidence and boldness to say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear. What can man do to me? Or some translations say, I will not fear what man can do to me. It doesn't make it a question, it makes it a statement. If God is for me, and we're going to see this verse in a minute under, under another topic, if God's for me, who can possibly be against me? But the first part of that verse is what we've got to have confidence in. That God is for us. That He is always with us. And, and this promise that He makes in Hebrews 12 is that same promise that He made to Joshua in Deuteronomy chapter 31. Be strong, be of good courage. And the promise is that you don't need to be afraid because God is the one who goes before you. He's not going to leave you or forsake you. You know, I, I thought about... I thought about how to word this, can, can you say that God is beside you? Yeah, you can say God's beside you. Can you say that God's behind you? Yeah, you can probably say that too. Where was God's position with Joshua? He's out in front of him. Where, where is God in your life? You, you can't place him. You know, is he walking beside you? Yeah. Is he walking out before? Uh, what, what was the point? What was the point that of this promise to Joshua. Why was that so significant that Joshua was, that he was out in front of Joshua? What was about ready to happen? Going into the promised land. Who's going to take the promised land? Whoever's out in front. Who's the point man? God is. For God's children, whether in the Old Testament or the New Testament, God has promised that He's always with us. And isn't that what Jesus said before He left the earth? Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. How much confidence do we have in, that, in, in, this, in this fact? We're going to talk about God's, if we're going to talk about God working in our lives, do we trust that at every moment of our day, He's with us? We're going to get to, and not tonight, but in the course of this particular study, we're going to get to the point of talking about prayer. What's the shortest verse in the Bible that uh, talks about prayer? It says, pray what? Without ceasing. And sometimes we think, okay, I'm going to pray and I'm going to bow my head and I'm going to talk to the God who's way off on the other side of the universe and we can't even see Him. If God is always with us, when we bow our head and pray, who are we praying to? We're praying to the God who's right there with us. We're praying to the God who has promised that He's not going to run away from us. He's not going to forsake us. We can. We can run away from Him and, and, and not have Him in our lives. But as long as we are His faithful children, His promise is, I am always there. Is that the providence of God? Is that God, is that God working in my life? Here, here's, these first two, three or four points are very similar to each other. I've tried to divide them out to have... Uh, to have some different points here. But not only is He with us, but God takes care of His children, doesn't He? I mean, it's one thing to say you're with somebody. It's another thing to take care of that person. You know, there's, there might be some people that are with you in your home and may or may not be taking care of you. Um, but God is with us and God's promise is that He's going to take care of us. Look at some of these verses uh, from the book of Psalms. I like this one from Psalm 37. The steps of a good man. You want to know where a righteous man is? The steps of a good man. They are ordered by the Lord. And he delights, God delights in the way of the righteous man. Why? Because he's following after God. He's always doing what's right. And so God delights in what he's doing. Though the, though the good man fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. If you're a good, righteous, upright person, does that mean you're never going to stumble, fall, get tripped up, have a bad day? Look at this passage. Here's the good man. He's following after the paths of God. And though he fall, it, it allows the fact that we're going that we're gonna have troubles. Though he fall, he's not going to be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. What does that mean? Here I am, a child of God. And God's special providence in my life is doing what? If I fall down, what's going to happen? 
He's going to pick me up. Why? Because he's upholding me with his hand. Is that the picture that you have of God in your life? Is the picture of God working in your life one that, you know, that, that when we fall, that, you know, sometimes people think if we fall and stumble that God's just going to kind of hold us down there until we learn our lesson. Is that my God? I'm going to stumble and fall, and if I want His help, He's going to pick me up with His own hand. I have been young, this is David's talking, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. What's he saying? Now that I'm old, now that I can look back on my life, now that I can look back on the life of others, I have never seen God's children forsaken. Was there any point in David's life where maybe David thought the Lord should have forsaken him? Yeah, you might be able to think of an occasion, couldn't you? David looks back not only on everybody else's life, but his own life and says, you know what? I fell, but the Lord's hand was there to uphold me. When David committed adultery, when David uh, lied about what was happening, when David had Uriah killed, when David and, and all of those things that transpired in that occasion, David was still being cared for by God. God wasn't pushing him down. God wasn't, uh, you've done this with your dog, haven't you? God wasn't taking his head and holding it down and rubbing his nose in what he had done. That wasn't God. God was ready to pick him up. God, David says, I've never seen one of God's children forsaken. And I've never seen, we'll talk about this point in just a minute, and in, in, in in I think the next point, but he says, I've never seen any of God's descendants begging bread. What passage does that remind you of? Matthew chapter 6. You know, the promises of God that he's going to take care of us and provide for us, and we'll see that in a minute. Psalm 33, our Lord wait, our soul waits for the Lord. Our God is our help, and he is our shield. Do you believe that? When you look at God, do, do you describe God as your help? Look in Matthew chapter 6. And I'm not going to put this up here because it's too, it's too extended. But get your Bible and look in Matthew chapter 6. And, and if this is not a passage uh, that just details for us the providence of God, then, there's, then you're not going to find one in the Bible. And uh, we could start in verse 25, but I wanted this to back up a few verses. Look at Matthew chapter 6, start in verse 19. What, what are we basically told? Verses 19 through 21. It's a passage that talks about the difference between laying up treasures on earth and treasures in heaven. What, what's the gist of those three verses? Hopefully somebody has an idea of what the gist of those three verses is about. Okay? You put God up front. In, in what way? What's specifically being talked about? It, okay, you put Him first. With all you have, you put him first. What's the, very la what's the very last sentence in verse 21? If you want the gist of these three verses, what's the very last sentence in verse 21? Wherever you put your treasure, that's where your heart's going to be. Wherever you place the most value in your life, that's where your life's going to go. That's where your heart is going to lead you. Is that true? Have you seen that in other people's lives? I mean, you, you, you can tell where people's heart is by looking where their treasure is, can't you? I mean, you, you can tell what, what their hopes and their dreams and their desires are by looking at their life. And there's some people in this world and, and some people in this congregation, they're not so concerned about material wealth. They're not so concerned about the, the, the acquisition of it. They're more the kind of people that they work so that they can have something to give. And you see that in people in this congregation. And maybe you see it in other people that you know. But they're not concerned about what they can have. They're concerned about helping other people. What does that tell you about that person's heart? I mean, we can't look on people's hearts, can we? No. But God can. But I can see fruits. And while I can't see their heart, the fruits that they produce, I can, I can get a glimpse 
And so this, this, before we get into God's providence in this latter part of the chapter, we back up to verse 19 where, where God says, where is your heart? What's most important to you? And he says, that, that's, where your tre- that's, what's gonna, that's where your treasure is going to be. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And that ties back into verses 19 through 21. There's your choices. You've got your choices between serving the things of this earth, the riches, the mammon of this earth, or you have the choice of serving God. You can't can't serve both, so you've got to choose. And when you choose, that'll be an indication of where your heart is. Now verse 25. Therefore I say to you, and this is the New King James, maybe different than than the the way yours reads. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Look uh, Look in verse 27. We're going to come back and look at all of this, but look at verse 27. Which of you by worrying? Verse 28. So why do you worry? Verse 31. Therefore do not worry. Uh, Verse 34. Therefore, do not worry. What's Jesus trying to say in these verses? Got any ideas? Stop worrying. That's what he's saying. Stop worrying. I mean, he, he's, he's like pointing the finger. I mean, if you were there and he could see your heart, what would he be doing? Pointing the finger. Stop worrying. What does it mean to worry? What's that all about? Some, some of you are professionals at it, so you've, you've probably got a good idea. What does it mean to worry? Dirk? Okay. That, that's, it, it, it demonstrates a lack of trust in God. What, what is it to worry? What, what are you doing when you worry? You're doubting, what'd you say? You're doubting the future. How many of you know the future? How many of you can see the future? That's why you worry, right? Can't see the future. How many of you know what's going to happen tomorrow? How many of you know what's going to happen when you wake up and go to work and drive on the roads or call your favorite sister and she choose you? I mean, nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. So what do we do? We worry about it. So it shows a lack of trust. It shows that I don't know what's going to happen in the future, so I get all twisted and turned and worried about it. What did you say, Freddie? I didn't hear what you said about worrying. Okay, lack of trust in, 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 in what's going to happen in our future, lack of trust in God. What are you, what are you doing when you're worrying? T- take, take, me, take me into your little cave and tell me what you're doing, when you're, or, or go to somebody else's cave. We don't have to make this personal. What's somebody doing when they're worrying? They're letting their brain think over and think over and think over whatever their problem is, and they're looking at it from this angle and this angle and this angle, and they're just worrying, 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 whatever this problem is with what they're not doing. Okay. Pray and worry at the same time. So here's, uh, here's somebody who's, whose brain is working overtime, trying to see something from every possible angle, perhaps. Anybody ever had a hard time going to sleep at night because you couldn't turn this off, or at least you were choosing not to turn it off? Hector, you had your hand up. Ah, there's a key part of this. Concerning yourself with things that are out of your control. Just for instance, look in verse 27, and that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Which of you by worrying can do what? Add one cubit to your stature. Uh, How many of you could control your height? Betty, how many of you, I'm sorry, how many of you, that was mean, how many of you could control your height? Only, uh, Only with heels. I knew I shouldn't have asked that question in mixed company. Uh, how many of you could worry yourself to the point that you could add 18 inches to your height? Could you do that? I mean, how, you, how many of you could worry yourself to the point that you could take 18 inches off your waist? I mean, I, I mean to go the other direction, I don't know. <laughs> Is worrying, you know, somebody saying, well, that, you know, you could do that. You could get so anxious, you know, you get yourself sick and you go in the hospital. And go, yeah, okay, that'd be beneficial, wouldn't it? Is your height in your control or not? No. 
Do many of us worry about our height? Uh, that's probably a loaded question and not fair. But uh, what's Jesus' point? There's things out of our control, and what do we do? We worry about them. That's what we do. We get ourselves so wrapped up in it, and if we back away for a moment, we think, okay, what is my worrying accomplishing right now? For us, absolutely nothing. Dirk? It's a huge waste of time. Is that true? Then, but, but we do it so well. You know, you know so I'm serious. Some of us have perfected the art, you know, of, of, of worrying. But what does it do? Are there any, are there any uh, physical or physiological uh, results, impacts? Ulcers. There's, there's a popular one. Stress, uh, high blood pressure. All of these sound like great things to have, right? I mean, these are the things we, we, we seek in life. You know, we become a teenager and say, man, if I can get on high blood pressure medication by the time I'm 30, and if I can do it, you know, these aren't things we seek. But we get them. And we get them a lot of times because we worry. Now, how does this fit in the context of a study about the providence of God? What is Jesus talking about in Matthew chapter 6? Look at verse 25. Therefore, I say to you, stop worrying about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life, what, is it, what does he mean by life? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? What does he mean by life? Is life more than food? Okay, our time on this earth. What did you say, Lonnie? Your existence. Is that not more than your food and where, what you're going to eat and where that food is going to come from? Jesus says, stop worrying. Okay, how am I supposed to stop worrying about my life? How, how would I stop being concerned about my food? You know, what it's going to be and where it's going to come from. And how, how am I supposed to, you know, when, when, you, have, when you have children who, who don't stay in clothes any more than, you know, five or six months, how are you not supposed to worry where that next set of clothes is going to come from, to, you know, so that they don't have to wear, you know, the high waters and, and the shirt that's way too small? How, are you, am, am I not supposed to be concerned about, about that happening? Okay, let's keep going. He tells us how to stop. Verse 26. Here's one way to stop. Look. It would help if you would look sometimes uh, to stop worrying. Sometimes we worry and we, uh, we get so wrapped up in ourselves that we don't, we don't just look. What are we supposed to look at? Oh, how about looking at the birds of the air? What's that supposed to do? Calm me down? I mean, it does for some people, right? That's why bird feeders are one of the hottest selling items, right? It's supposed to be a soothing, calming, you know, activity to have to... Look at the bird. What are we looking at? Look at the birds. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. Wouldn't it be nice if they did? You know, but birds aren't smart enough to do that. But where are they getting their food? Notice what he says. Who's giving it to them? Who's feeding them? According to this verse, who's feeding them? The, I want the exact words. Your heavenly Father. He could have said God's feeding them and it would have just been just the same. But he says, guess who's feeding them? Your heavenly Father. Hmm. My heavenly Father is feeding the birds? What does he care about birds for? He's my Father. He's not the bird's Father. You know, and, we, and so we could sit here and ponder, you know. But he says, it's your heavenly Father who's feeding them, verse 26, the end of it, are you not of more value than they? What's the answer to that question? Yes, you are. Hmm. If God's taking care of those birds that are not as valuable as I am, I wonder what God, I wonder what, correct that, my heavenly Father would do for me. Verse 27, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? These are things that are not in your control, and yet you sit there and you worry. Verse 28, so why do you worry about your clothing? Consider, if you want something to think about, 
If you want something to sit there and mull over in your head, he says, think about this. Consider the lilies of the field. They grow, they neither toil nor spin. How are they doing this? And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much, what's the next word? More clothe you, O you of little faith. Here's the birds. Are you not more, va more valuable than the birds? Yes. Here's the grass. Here's the lilies. They're being taken care of by God. Are you not of more value than they are? And yet we worry. Verse, verse 31. Therefore, and, and notice how many times he says, is, is, is this a suggestion? When he says it in verse 25, when he says it in verse 31, when he says it in verse 34, when Jesus says, do not worry, is that a suggestion? Folks, that's a command. Somebody says, oh, I, I, I can't obey that one. I can't fulfill that. You know, I've just, I've got so much going on. I mean, I just can't stop. Okay, why not? Jesus says, stop. It's, it's interesting and, and uh, just, just for information's sake. In verse 25, it's in the present tense when he says, do not worry. Stop worrying. Stop it right now. Don't let it continue. When you get over to verse 31, it's, it's in the Greek past tense, which signifies, and I don't even want you to start. First one says, if you're doing it, stop. Verse 31 in the, the Greek tense just signifies, and if you're not doing it, don't get any ideas. Don't even start it. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Aren't those things you should be a little bit concerned about? I mean, most people want to eat. Most people want to drink. And I hope most people want to have something to put on. It would be nice if more people wanted, wanted to have something to put on, right? Don't worry about these things. Verse 32. For after all these things, what happens? The Gentiles are seeking. Here are the Gentiles who've got themselves all wrapped up in the things of this world. But verse 32, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. And that's the key. Here we are spending our life worrying about things. And specifically, as Jesus talks about here, worrying about our food, worrying, worrying about our drink, worrying about just the necessities of life, what we're going to put on. But what does Jesus say? Here we are, and our minds are just turning over about these things. Our, our stomachs, our guts, are turning over about the things of life. And it's this one little phrase here where it says, Your heavenly Father knows. Now what does that mean? What does that mean to you? Here I sit, and I worry, and I worry, and I get stressed out, and I'm full of anxiety, and, 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 and you know, I'm going to the doctor because I've got all of these symptoms and all of these struggles, and it's a result of my own anxiety. And Jesus says, He knows. Yeah, but what about the people who aren't <coughs> handling their resources correctly, and <laughs> they end up with no money, and it's their fault? Okay. What about people who are... Take care of them. In other words, you get, you get your payday, you spend all your money foolishly, you have no money, are you, are, you're going to have to worry about your kids and your food. Well, so and your do, do we have to uh, pay consequences for our decisions? Uh, are we commanded even to be good stewards of those things that we have? So these, these, this if, means for people who have done... Well, let, we're, we're, we're going to see, yes, we're going to see that in just a minute. Uh, if I make foolish decisions, am I going to have to pay for foolish decisions? But tie in that what David said in the Psalms. I've never seen God's people forsaken. I've never seen God's people begging for food. Now why is that? Oh, two hands just shoot up. Gwen? 
Was she? I, I'm sorry, we didn't have a buzzer. Do, do, as parents, do you know things about your children and their needs? You know, do you know that they, you know, need, uh, you know, clothes and they need to eat meals, you know, most every day? And, you know, they, they have certain needs as human beings. And if they were, you know, it's, it's not a bad analogy that if, if they were to start, you know, asking you all sorts of questions about those and being concerned about them, and you're like, get over it, kid. I've got it under control. Um, well, that's, that's God. He's got things under, he, and, and I love the phrase, of, he knows. He absolutely knows the needs. Now, to get to Bonnie's point, verse 33. What, what's your first word in verse 33? Why but? I mean, did, how, does that, how does that make sense? I mean, but is usually, you know, you're a nice person, but, you know, and whatever's going to follow is going to be like, oh, I'm not really a nice person. Uh, you know, we say the word but, it's a contrast. I mean, it's a word of contrast. Emily? Do not do this, but do this. That's what it is. Do not worry. Do not worry. Do not worry. He said it over and over. Okay. I don't worry. What do I do? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What's going to happen? If I, it, it go, and that's why we started back in verse 19. If I put God first in my life, if the treasure of my life is serving God, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my life? Am I going to become, am I going to become a millionaire? In heaven, yeah, the retirement plan's not bad. Lonnie? That was my point earlier. God knows what we need. He doesn't necessarily say he's going to give us what we want. Right. But he knows what we need, and he knows what we need. So, it, verse 32 is he knows, well, he knows what you want. He could have said in verse 32, you know, the Lord knows what you want, because he knows that too. But the point is here, he knows what you need. And folks, we need to learn to trust that God knows. And just put, put the period there. What does he know? He knows what I need. He knows what's bothering me. He knows what I'm going to need. He, he knows the struggles I'm having. He, he knows what so-and-so said to me today and how it hurt me. He know, what is, just put a period there for a minute. Don't worry. He knows. And have the heart... That, that prays without ceasing. That when so-and-so does say something to you, or when you, when you have concern about losing a job and all of a sudden, how am I going to take care of my family? You know, is a Christian never going to get fired? Anybody ever know a Christian that lost their job? I mean, is a Christian never going to lose their job? Is a Christian never going to face financial difficulties? Hello, do we have Christians living in Florida? I mean, are there any Floridians facing financial difficulties because of insurance and taxes? I mean, hello, but are Christians never going to have to face that? Stop worrying about it. Where am I going to come up with the money to pay my property tax? Where am I going to come up with the money to pay the increase in insurance? Where am I going to come up with the money to pay the gas prices these days? Where am I? Stop worrying. Now, that, that doesn't mean... That doesn't mean I become a lazy person and I sit back and I say, well, I just lost my job, but I'm a Christian and God will find me another one. That's true, but what do I have to do? I got to get out there and do something about it. If a man's not going to work, neither shall he eat. I have a responsibility to, as, as a citizen of God to be a citizen of this country and to have fulfill my responsibilities as a part of it. So I don't become lazy and expect God to fill in the holes. But I do what God expects of me, and He promises me that He is going to take care of me. That's His promise. And, and yet, 
and yet we read the passage, we affirm this, we say that's what it says, and we go home tonight, and what are we going to start doing? We're going to start, look at verse 34, we're going to, when we get home tonight, we're going to start worrying about tomorrow, right? I mean, that's what's on our mind. All right, I got, I got to get ready for tomorrow, so I'm going to get all, oh man, I, I don't want to do that. Oh boy, that's going to be painful when I go there. Oh, I don't want to talk to that. Oh, I don't know what's going to, what does verse 34 say about tomorrow? What, what does tomorrow have that today, that today had to and that yesterday had to? What does tomorrow have? Man, it's got its own worries. Why do you want to borrow trouble? Why do you want to borrow worries from, yes, from, from tomorrow that, that you don't have today when you've already got those things that are happening today? And why do you want to worry about yesterday when you already got your own things today and you know there's going to be more things tomorrow? Stop worrying about tomorrow. You know, we, we often say, you know, we don't need to worry about tomorrow because we know who holds tomorrow. It's in his hands. Grim? There's a verse in the Psalm, I, don't, I can't find it right now, I don't know where it is, but it says, the Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Yeah, I, I can't think of it either, but the Lord, the idea in the Psalms that the Lord will accomplish, uh, you know, what concerns me. It talks about there about the promises about the promises of God and the assurance that we need to have that what God, what God has promised, He's going to accomplish. Has God promised to take care of me as His child? Do I need to worry about the how of it? That's what I do. Yeah, that's right. He is. How's He going to do it? When's He going to do it? We trust God that He is going to take care of us. That no matter what happens in our lives, there's not, if, if, and, and the key is verse 33. That's, that's, this isn't just a verse that we pick out and say, here's a good verse to memorize and just pick a random verse. The key is, when I put God first, and notice what it says, seek ye first, does it say God? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, His church, and His righteousness, doing what God says, and if that's first in my life, if that, verses 19 through 21, is the treasure and that's where my heart is, what's going to happen? There's never going to be a moment in my life where I need to worry about stuff. I grew up with a dad who told me that if you worry about something and you pray about something, that the worrying's going to cancel out your prayer. Um, there's no verse that says it in that particular way. But if I pray to God to help me and to take care of something, and then I say amen, and then I start worrying about how it's going to happen and worrying about how I'm going to do it. What have I done? I've taken the trust that I just placed in God in that prayer, and I said, God, I really don't think you can handle it. Give it back to me, and I'll take care of it. Sorry? Well, we like to help him. We, we need to help him. You know, it's not that we don't act and we don't work. Um, but, uh, but is God going to take care of it? He's going to take care of it. And that's got to be, that's, and Dan, I'm coming to you. That's the interesting part of the end of verse 30. Don't you know this, O you of little faith? And that's where we are sometimes. Dan, go ahead. Yeah. Well, worry is not some isolated part of our life where, you know, it just affects, you know, this little bubble over here. You know, when we worry, uh, it, it, it can affect all of us. And as Dan says, that's that doesn't need to be a part of our, of our righteousness at all. OK, I told you we weren't going to get very far as far as the slides go tonight. But I think we had a, a, a good discussion about Matthew six. We're going to uh, let the other classes join us. And uh, we're going to we're going to continue in just a